Hello and welcome to this new episode of Bootstrapping Your Dreams show. I'm your host Manoj Agarwal and today we'll be talking with a very very special guest Jeffrey Madoff. Uh he Jeffrey is an immensely successful director, photographer, writer and professor in New York, New York. Uh he's the founder and CEO of Madoff uh, Productions, a film production company that creates award-winning branded content. Jeffrey has edited and directed award-winning commercials, documentaries, web content around the world. for very well known clients like Ralph Lauren, Victoria's Secret, Tiffany's, Radio City, American Academy of Dramatic Arts, Howard University and Cornell Medical College. He's sought after speaker and has lectured at NYU, uh Google, Wharton School, um uh SXSW in Brazil, Verizon, Barclays and many more. He has written um and is the executive producer of a play about rock and roll Hall of Fame legend Lloyd Price. which premieres in May 2021 at People's Light Theater and he's an adjunct uh, professor at Parson School of Design uh, teaching a course he developed called Creativity Making a Living with Your Ideas. Welcome Jeffrey. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Awesome. So, uh you've had a tremendously successful career. You have uh, worked with some of the biggest names in the world, but let's uh, go down the memory lane and and uh, uh understand how you got started um, where did your journey start and how did you find the success that you have uh, attained over the years well how far back do you want to go how far <laughs> depends on how much time you have <laughs> <laughs> so you know i always had jobs when i was a kid and i was always thinking of things to do i had no master plan by the way uh but one of the things that i did that i always loved doing was writing. I always wrote stories and I'd illustrate the stories. I used to make my own comic books. And I had a movie theater in the basement of my home. Oh, wow. So, so uh it wasn't that impressive, but it was impressive enough that if I designed these posters, posted them around the neighborhood, there'd be 15, 20 kids that would show up. Oh, wow. And the uh there was 8 mm, super 8 mm. So there wasn't sound so i would take my sister's stereo and i would use i'd find music that went with the images i would find <laughs> sound effects then i would put them onto a tape recorder so i could like sync it up with the movie wow. and when i look back you know i became a video editor and director and you know i loved making these movie when i was a kid So it's funny I think a lot of times if you look at what you love doing when you were a kid yeah 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 if you can think of some way to make a living at that later on mm -hmm. uh it's great so you know I did that I also had lots of different kinds of sales experience I had a paper route nice. I used to do door to door sales when I was a teenager which I don't think these days people would even open the door for anybody <laughs> uh, but back then you know I was uh 15 16 years old I wore a sport jacket and tie went door to door selling things and it was a novelty uh to the women who were working at home and you know that this at the time cute kid was so are you working your way through school and I'd say yes I am and uh they would always be nice and offer me lemonade on hot days and it was I was a novelty and so that was fun But the great thing that I learned in terms of door-to-door -door sales is you had to engage people instantaneously. Yeah, yeah. You know, because otherwise they just shut the door in your face. <laughs> so you had to learn really quickly how to talk to people and how to get them involved and so they didn't shut the door in your face and you could make a sale. Mm -hmm. And uh I had a lot of different jobs. You know, I was a tombstone setter and I never had a customer that said they didn't like what I did. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> of course the tombstone setters deal with people who are 6 feet under so they don't talk that much. Yeah. But uh you know it was it was really that was an interesting job too actually. And uh so I've had a a wide and varied range of experience and all of those things that I did informed what I did when I got older. Uh -huh. And uh you know I learned and so my first adult actual career move was when I was uh, I had just finished college at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I had a double major in psychology and philosophy. 
and I had been on the wrestling team. So that was a great combination uh, and uh, prepared me for business. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working in a small clothing boutique and a dear friend of mine who's a dear friend to this day uh, called me up and said, could you, he had graduated a year before me. And he said, can you think of some kind of gig that would earn more than bank interest? Yeah. yeah. And I said, well, I see the clothes we sell and I could always draw. I used to draw when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll design clothes. Mm -hmm. They said, okay. And he sent me a check, which was at the time more money than I had ever had at one time. And that was $1,500. Wow. And I started that company, uh, had some of the sewers who sewed, you know, who did alterations for the store, make some samples, had 18 shirts in the store. They sold out in one day and we were not a big store. Wow. We were a very small store, made some more, sold out, put a sample case together, uh, strapped them on the back of my motorcycle, drove to Chicago, uh, went to 18 boutiques and sold 15 of them. Uh -huh. So I had proof of concept. I had a business. Uh, I was totally ignorant as to how to do that business, but I fortunately wasn't stupid. And the difference is when you're ignorant, you can learn when you're stupid, that's forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I learned and uh, my business doubled like every three or four months. And within a year and a half, uh, I had 110 people working for me, uh, two factories offices in New York and Los Angeles and national salesmen. And, uh, you know, I was off and running in a business that I was learning as I was going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but that ended up informing everything else that I've done since. I see. That's great. So it sounds like you had, uh, you know, you had a lot of, um, luck on your side. You knew what you wanted to do. You got the opportunities which sort of leverage your skills that you already had. Um, a lot of people don't get, uh, you know, uh, life that easy. Uh, but surely you had some other challenges uh, when you were starting off. So uh, can you share a few challenges that you remember that had some sort of an Im impact on you? Yeah. First of all, I wasn't lucky. <laughs> uh, I want to be clear about that. I work really hard. Mm -hmm. And luck is the recognition of an opportunity and being ready to take advantage of it. Exactly. exactly. That's how I look at luck. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was working very hard all the time in terms of trying to make the business go. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a lot of obstacles to overcome. I mean, initially, when I got my first group of sales, when I went to Chicago, as I mentioned, uh, I got like 55000 dollars worth of sales. Now this is back in like 1971. That was a lot. Mm -hmm. But the bigger challenge wasn't selling. And this is what I think a lot of entrepreneurs lose sight of. It's how do you deliver what you sold mm -hmm. in a timely fashion <laughs> and make a profit so you can keep growing your business. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so my first challenge was how am I going to get this made? because the people that showed my samples couldn't make that quantity. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I was a kid, a lot of the salesmen didn't want to work with me. I went to the Chicago Merchandise Mart to buy fabric wholesale. Mm -hmm. And because I was a kid and my hair was down to here, I had hair then and it was <laughs> down to here, uh, you know, they weren't interested. But there were a few that were and that were really nice. And those people guided me. And one of them said to me, do you have a contractor? And I said, I'm not sure. What is a contractor? <laughs> they said, well, a contractor is somebody who has a factory who will manufacture your clothes for you. I see, I see. And I said, no, I don't. Uh, and they said, well, how are you going to make the clothes with all this fabric you're buying? And I said, yeah, I was going to have to find that out. Was I? <laughs> and so, uh, he said, well, let me call somebody for you. Uh, I have somebody who I've done a lot of work with. Great guy. Maybe he can help you out. Yeah. And through that, the kindness of that salesman, I met my first contractor who was a great guy who taught me a lot. And uh, it was funny when I showed up in his office in Montello, Wisconsin at his factory, which is a small little town I had never heard of. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, I show up on my motorcycle and he's got a cigarette hanging from his lower lip and he's going, just shaking his head when he sees me. <laughs> and uh, he said, all right, bring your stuff in. And I do. And he said, let me see what you made. Put it on the cutting table. And I take it out. And he said, you sold this shit? <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, people actually bought this shit. <laughs> and I said, yeah, they did. He said, balls. <laughs> well, with me doing your work, you're going to make a million dollars. And he was a great guy and became a mentor to me in terms of the manufacturing and so on. I'm, I'm using the term mentor. He really was a friend who helped educate me. I guess that could be a mentor. Yeah. But he was a great guy. And I was fortunate to meet somebody who could really help me get going. Yeah. On the other hand, I met contractors who totally screwed me up. Uh, I had to make a huge decision when I was quite young. I was probably 22, our biggest selling jacket of the season, mm -hmm. which I sold thousands of. They totally screwed up the manufacturing of. I had to make a decision because I kept being told to send it out. Some people will return it, but you know, the ones that don't, at least you'll make some money. And I thought, but you know, you only have one time that you can lose your integrity yeah, yeah. because your integrity, when you lose it, it's gone forever. Yeah. So I made the difficult decision to not ship it and to basically write a letter explaining to my clients what had happened, apologizing, but also telling them that I could not ship them the merchandise. Well, that lost a lot of money for me and that was very, very painful. But I also had and still have this kind of idealism about how you do business with people. Yeah. And so uh, that hurt. And that was a big obstacle to overcome because any of us who have been in business know that it seems to be a lot quicker to fall into the hole and a lot longer to climb out of it. Sure. You know, and I had different times, like when there was a uh, recession in the early 70s, and all of a sudden stores who paid me in 30 days were taking three, four months to pay. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a number of stores went out of business who owed me money. So, you know, I think, Manuj, one of the mythologies about entrepreneurship is that, you know, it's this one way rocket to the stars <laughs> and it's hard. It's hard to, it's easy to start a business. It's hard to build it. It's even harder to sustain it. Yeah, yeah. And most people don't speak honestly about the difficulties in business. So, you know, there were days that I was so thrilled with everything that was going on and it was really exciting. And then there's days I'm sitting at my desk wondering, how am I going to meet payroll? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, you ricochet around. And I think that's part of any entrepreneur's journey. Right. And anybody who thinks it's just this straight rocket ship to fame and riches is really naive yeah. because it's not. It's it's a difficult it's a difficult path. Yeah, no, that's for sure. And and, uh, you know, when I when I say you are lucky, um, what I was more referring to is like a lot of uh, especially young people these days. When you ask them what do they want to do, they, they generally don't have a very clear idea on uh, what exactly their passion is. They uh, Generally, the answer is, I just want to make a lot of money, right? Uh, and uh, and that's where I think just having a little bit of an understanding about yourself, about what your passion is, helps a lot. And uh, to your point, we're working hard. The harder you work, uh, the luckier you get is, is essentially the, the universal truth everybody finds out sooner or later. Um, and then one thing I want to point out is like your ability to go out there and hustle and, and talk to a lot of people and learn from the mistakes. Uh, that's another quality that a lot of people don't have because the first two or three, um, you know, major setbacks they have, they just give up and say, oh, you know, this is not for me. I better go look for a job now. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that it's important to have a realistic sense of what you're up against. Yeah. yeah. I think that being ignorant when you're young is a kind of blessing because if you knew all the things, the minefield that was ahead of you, yeah. you might not want to take the risk of doing that, mm -hmm. you know, but the fact is that 
I think that's the blissful ignorance of youth. Uh, and I didn't know the difficulties, but I'm the kind of person when I get into difficulties, I figure a way out of them, <laughs> you know, uh, and it's not always easy, but it's, I, I wanted to clarify that it's not that I had some burning desire to start a clothing company mm -hmm. that I thought about it. The first time I thought about starting a clothing company is when my friend called me up and asked me if I could think of a gig that would earn more than bank interest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I would have happened to have been in a restaurant, I might've said, hey, why don't we open a restaurant? <laughs> you know, <laughs> And, uh, you know, so it was situational. It wasn't like, Oh, I really want to start a clothing company. It just kind of happened out of, again, that ignorance that I had, but I knew more about that business and I knew very little, but that was more than I knew about any other business. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the case um, in most, in, you know, every entrepreneur I talk to, including my own case, it generally turns out that way. You start somewhere else and you end up somewhere else. Um, but tell me uh, about the next phase of your journey. So from clothing, you get uh, got into these creative um uh, creative uh, work like you know uh, making documentaries, films, uh, writing plays, writing books. So how did that transition happen? So I had a wonderful financial backer in Wisconsin, a very good man, and he was a lawyer. He was a fifth generation Wisconsinite, mm -hmm. and by the way, I'm from Akron, Ohio originally, but went to college in in Wisconsin he found my business really interesting. His daughter and I were friends mm -hmm. and she said, Oh, you should meet my dad. And I did. And he was just a great guy. And he thought I was interesting. He thought the possibilities of the business were interesting. And because I was employing so many people, like 110 people, uh, they all banked at his bank. Oh, I see. And so he made it clear to me uh, when I told him finally that I wanted to move to New York he said, uh, you know what, you know why I finance you, you're providing employment for Wisconsin people. Mm -hmm. And if you move to New York and you move the base of the business there, I'm not going to continue to back you. I see. And I thought, you know, money comes and goes and time only goes. Yeah, yeah. And I had learned that lesson from my father and just knew that, my next step had to be New York, that I couldn't stay in Wisconsin any longer. There was nobody that knew the business there. Uh, being a younger person who was ambitious and trying to do things set me apart, but I was kind of a larger fish in a very small pond. And I wanted to be in a place where there was a lot happening. And there's no place that has more happening than New York City. Sure. So I made the decision, you know, to move. And, uh, and it was kind of interesting and also I think plays into the notion of risk that your listeners might be interested in because people said to me, so you're going to move to New York. Do you have a job lined up? I said, no. Well, do you know people there? No. Do you have a place to stay? No. <laughs> and they said, well, aren't you afraid of what's going to happen when you go there? And I said, you know, I'm actually afraid of what's going to happen if I stay here. Mm, nice. And so the risk of moving, when I looked at just a spectrum of risk, yeah. the risk of moving was far more uncomfortable for me than the risk of moving on. Yeah. So the risk of staying is, is something that I didn't want to do. And I thought about, so what's the worst thing that can happen? And I think it's useful to think of risk on a certain spectrum. What's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah. Worst thing that happens is things don't work out. Can I move back? Yeah. yeah. Could I move to, back to my parents? I, I got along great with my parents, but I was done with that era of my life. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe I find another job. But, you know, you figure it out. You know, you figure it out. And so... I moved and I, when we liquidated the business, I had enough money that if I lived modestly, I could travel and I had about a year's worth of money saved up. Okay. Uh, so I lived in 11 or 12 different places in New York. You know, I would house sit so I didn't have to pay rent and then I could travel. Yeah. And I sort of just experienced more of the world. 
I see. I see. Then I ran out of money <laughs> and started in another clothing company. Okay. Uh, because I had a very good reputation. I knew how to design saleable clothes. I was able to raise money to start a business again. And I did that and I built another business and then sold it. Okay. And, uh, then the transition was, uh, it's interesting. There was also a situation in that business that called integrity into question where I was, uh, a acquisition for a very large German company okay. and they were buying, uh, they were investing in American businesses and their head of, uh, the head of the company here, when they, when they bought my company, uh, we had a meeting before we met with all the executives from Germany and, uh, it was the first quarter meeting mm -hmm. and they gave me my spreadsheet for my presentation. And I noticed that there was a few hundred thousand dollars there that I didn't know where it came from, but it was somehow on my spreadsheet. Okay. And I said, what's this? And he said, don't worry about it. And I said, what do you mean? Don't worry about it. What? I don't, I can't justify these funds. Mm -hmm. I told you, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. But what I realized was he was embezzling from the company. Oh, wow. So, uh, he said, just keep your mouth shut and just do the meeting. Okay. And so 20 of us around a conference table. And since I was the newest acquisition of the company, they wanted me to go first. And uh, the first thing I said was, I'd like to I thank you all for being here. This is my first quarter with you. And uh, I have to tell you, I don't really understand quite how things are done here because there's about $250,000 on my balance sheet that I have no idea how this was spent, where it was from, what it's assigned to. And I see the guy who threatened me starting to just vibrate. Wow. And I said, but I think that you should ask him what happened to that money. Cause I sure don't know. Uh -huh. And he got up and threatened me and that's where the wrestling comes in. <laughs> 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 and uh, I was a lot younger then. And, you know, I thought, uh, wow, I, you know, I didn't really know the world operated like that. And he threatened me and I was actually kind of ready for his threats. And what ended up happening is they asked me to take over their American acquisitions. He ended up getting fired, they asked me to take over, uh, offering me a very substantial salary and a budget to be acquiring businesses. And my parents said, well, why don't you just do that for like a couple of years? You could make a lot of money. And I said, uh, I don't want to be looking over my shoulder all the time. Oh. And that's the kind of company this is. And uh, that's just, it's not worth it to me. Yeah. So I mentioned that story because you're right. So many people think an end in itself is how much money did you make? Yeah. And to me, it's more important. How did you make it? And what's associated with the making of that money are you proud of what you do and how you did it? And I think that the question that young entrepreneurs, actually anybody should ask themselves is what does success look like to you? Mm, yeah. How do you define success? Is it the acquisition of money, having lots of other things? You know, I know, I know extremely wealthy people, yeah, yeah. five houses and 10 cars and, you know, everything that you would ever want materially and they're miserable. <laughs> they're not happy because they hit a point when they're in their late forties or fifties that is this all there is? Cause it wasn't fulfilling. And so I have always wanted to go more towards fulfillment and happiness. Not that they're mutually exclusive. You know, my, my grandmother was a very wise woman and she said, it's much better to be rich and healthy than poor and sick, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, she, and she was right. But, uh, you know, I, I just always had that sense that, um, 
it's not worth compromising what your fundamental values and principles are to make money in business. Yeah. And uh, so I didn't take the job. And uh, during that transitional time, I met some people who were starting a uh, video company. I got involved with well, actually making a feature film. Okay. And uh, I got involved with them, and it was quite an illustrious group of uh, kind of outsiders. I don't know if you ever heard of Dennis Hopper, but uh -huh. Dennis Hopper is a, was quite a famous actor who just died a few years ago, and William Burroughs, who was the epitome, one of the iconic figures of the Beat Generation, and they were going to be making a movie out of one of his books. And Hopper was going to star in it and, and direct it. And I met them because one of the companies I bought fabric from, the owner said to me, do you know anything about the movie business? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I go to movies, but I don't know much about the business. And he said, well, my son is about your age and he's gotten involved with these people. And I don't maybe a bit questionable, but you got a good head on your shoulders. Would you mind meeting him? I see. And I said, I'd be happy to meet him. And that's how I fell in with this group and ended up, the film never got made, but uh, I developed an intuitive interest in film and had an intuitive knowledge about how to shoot, how to edit, how to do those things. So I taught myself the film business and eventually started my own production company. Amazing, amazing. Um, now let's uh, go forward. Like, you know, you, you, uh, you are well known around the world for uh, like amazing branding and and really understanding the brand and bringing out the values that you know all these iconic brands they want to project and uh, i'm sure you had a um, big hand in, in promoting some of these brands and and and, and uh, making them what they are today so uh, tell us a little bit about branding like you know what what does really uh, branding mean because i think there's a lot of misconceptions around what it actually means um, and then we can dive a little bit deeper into how you uncover these values and project it to the to the audience so it's a that's a great question because there's a lot of misconception about what a brand is some people confuse marketing and advertising with being a brand which it isn't mm -hmm. uh so there is a brand and there is branding mm -hmm. uh branding is the marketing and the advertising and the message that you try to put out there to your consumer public yeah the brand is something else the brand is essentially a story that's well told and that brand uh, creates the effectiveness of a brand uh, and how well you tell your story is what connects the consumers to that brand. Okay. So if you look back at Walt Disney, mm -hmm. you know, although he didn't say and it wasn't part of the business vernacular at that time, we're going to build a brand. What Disney did, and he had such an audacious vision that he first starts with Disneyland. That wasn't big enough. Let's go Disney World, you know? <laughs> and so he created actually the first, I think it was the first immersive brand where you could go to the amusement parks. You would be totally, totally immersed in the fantasy of that business and you could buy products, whether it's Mickey Mouse shirts or whatever. Uh, and, you know, they spun into books, into TV shows, into movies, and just an astounding array of things around that lifestyle that sprung from the initial cartoon character that Disney uh, started off with, which was Mickey Mouse. Yeah. And so the brand was family entertainment. And all good brands you can distill down to a few words, a short sentence. You know, Nike is athletic excellence. Uh, Victoria's Secret is the promise of sexy. Mm -hmm. You know, the BMW, the ultimate driving machine. Yeah. Uh, Apple computers, hip innovation. Yeah. And so it takes, though, a long time to distill what the values and aesthetic and what a brand stands for into a story that is plausible and that can last. And uh, so being a storyteller at heart, which I am, positioning a brand, understanding what an effective brand story is and how do you create that emotional link with the consumer, 
was something I found really intriguing because it was both a creative and intellectual exercise. And I'm now not talking about the logo and the font and the colors that you use and so on. I'm talking about something which I think is a lot deeper, which is what is the story that can be built on over the years to build an emotional tie with the consumer? So whatever new product you bring out, like Apple does, for instance, you know, Apple doesn't make much off their computers anymore. It's all the other stuff they do. But the brand loyalty is so strong that anything Apple brings out, their very loyal following will buy into simply because it's Apple. For sure. Um, and it, it fascinates me as well. Like, you know, how do you tell that story? Especially um, when I talk to entrepreneurs, uh, this is what I found. Especially uh, entrepreneurs who are starting off, they tend to try to imitate these uh, well-established brands like Apple. And they get uh, into this uh, spiral of trying to copy Apple. And obviously, they don't have the resources to do that. So. What kind of advice you will uh, you can give to somebody who may not have all the resources that these large corporations have uh, in order to build a, a brand uh, that can carry them over to to a stage where they can sustain um, you know to sustain the business? So another great question uh, because I get asked a lot when should we start thinking about what our brand is, mm -hmm. and my answer is always. Now, yeah. you should have been thinking of it when you started your business. Yeah. And you're right. Most companies, you know, Apple wasn't always this big company, this largest company in the world situation, the first trillion dollar company. Mm -hmm. uh, they started off in a garage. Disney started off doing black and white cartoons. Mm -hmm. You know, so these companies weren't always huge. One of the interesting obstacles I had in my business was... The first thing potential clients would say to me was, well, we're no Ralph Lauren. I see. We're no Victoria's Secret. Uh, and it was that was code for we don't have the same kind of budgets they have. <laughs> and uh, but the thing is, I know that, you know, and again, they didn't start off big, but it gives you an example, a living example of the power of a brand how big those companies became. I mean, Nike started off, they were making the shoes in a waffle iron, mm -hmm. literally making the soles in a waffle iron. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's fascinating because people don't realize, they think that these companies were these huge entities initially, and they weren't, but they were always thinking about their product and how their product related to their consumer. They established, like I did with my shirts, a proof of concept from the beginning that there was they're not the only ones that think it's a good idea. There's actually a market for it. Yeah. And so then it requires a lot of self-examination. What are the values? Why should people buy your product? Why did you even start the company? What do you think is there that's going to attract consumers? And if you're going to try to copy what Apple did or what Ralph Lauren did or what Nike did, you're not going to succeed yeah. because you've already become a derivative of something that already exists. Yeah. So how do you think about what you're doing in an original way with an original perspective that can make it seem fresh so that your message can break through the clutter? Yeah. yeah. And so you have to do a deep dive into all of those things about why you started the business. Who is this going to appeal to? Why does it appeal to them? So you can start really understanding and recognizing what your story is. Yeah, yeah. And it's oftentimes really hard for the entrepreneur to come up with that alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, and you've probably seen this too, because you've worked with a lot of startups, is that it gets really hard for them to delegate. Yeah, yeah. And as a result, they do too many things not well. True, true. And um, to, you know, the interesting point I noticed when you answered this question is, it almost is easier if they start to look at themselves rather than look at other brands and try to imitate them, right? Yes, that's right. I mean, other brands can tell you that there is a marketplace, yeah. you know, and, but there's also a, what I call the myth of replication. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Apple, first of all, was not the first smartphone. Mm -hmm. First smartphone was the Palm Pilot. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Right. Then Blackberry, yeah. then Apple. 
because those companies screwed up. They lost sense of their vision and they screwed up. And, you know, Steve Jobs was obsessive about maintaining brand integrity and he was a great brand steward in terms of what he did. Mm -hmm. uh, forget about whatever he was like personally in terms of his business and what he did. He, he was impeccable mm -hmm. on all those things and the user interface. So he decided very early on user interface and design are critically important to success. Yeah. And so if you think of Apple uh, and you think of name any computer brand other than, than Apple. Dell. Uh, um, okay. okay, Dell, that's good. So Dell's a good example. People are very excited about Apple products, right? So when a new iPhone comes out, people are lined up around the block to get it. And that's true globally, not just in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I'm also willing to bet you that all of those people in line have a functioning phone. <laughs> you know, they don't really need to be staying out two or three nights in the rain to get the phone first, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a brand because it, it, it's really like a religion. And yeah. there's a cultish devotion to the symbols of that religion. Mm -hmm. be it a crucifix, the star of David, the Muslim moon, or uh, the Apple yeah. logo. Yeah. And that's where logos come in. Yeah. And so you get this kind of devoted following, but you get that devoted following through an incredible story. So Christianity has the Bible and there's this incredible story or the Quran. These are incredible stories that really hypnotize people. Yeah. and seduce them into the that belief system. Well, products are the same thing. Apple has done the same thing. Now we go back to Dell. Who's excited about their Dell computer? Nobody, okay? You know, it's just not exciting. It may work as well, uh, but there's not the story around it. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you can customize it. it you get the souped up components good value for the money, good customer service, but that's eh, kind of boring. You never knew what kind of a processor was in an Apple computer. Yeah. Uh, they just announced they're actually going to start creating their own processors. That was just announced by Tim Cook today. But the thing that's interesting about it is that they don't have to talk about their features. They don't talk about how light it is. They don't talk about the processor speed. They don't talk about the pixels and the screen. They don't talk about any of that. They talk about the Apple world that, you know, they show people having fun with the product, engaging with the product in some way that makes it seem really cool and really hip, not anything that has to do with the technical specs of the product. Mm -hmm. So when you're a brand, you're busy marketing and pre-selling what you make through the strength of your marketing, the strength of your story. And as much as everybody's heard of Dell in terms of, well, what do they stand for and what's the brand story? Who knows? Yeah. But Apple has that story that seduces so many people. Yeah. And that's just, you know, a clear indication of the difference between a brand and a commodity. Yeah, yeah. And what separates a brand from a commodity, there's lots of car companies, but people like Mercedes or they like BMWs. But what separates a, a brand from a commodity is that there's a story that acts as a magnet to draw the consumers in. Great. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, everybody who's uh, trying to build a brand, they should just, um, their first step should be to figure out their story. I mean, it could be their personal story. It could be their entrepreneurial story, whatever it is, right? Right. That's right. So you look at a company like Warby Parker, yeah. okay? Yeah. So they, uh, they couldn't find glasses that they liked and buying a pair of glasses was a pain in the ass. Yeah. So they streamlined and simplified the whole process to solve a problem that they recognized was a problem for lots of people. Yeah. You know, Airbnb uh, happened when the two founders couldn't find a hotel room. Mm -hmm. And so they rented out somebody's apartment yeah. and they realized, you know, in a lot of these uh, cities, there are things that are going on. Hotel rooms are hard to get and really expensive. Yeah. But how about if people repurpose their apartments they used it. It allowed them to be an entrepreneur and created an income stream for them. And you could create a more personal experience because you weren't staying in a hotel. And it could even be more cost efficient than that. And so they started Airbnb. Yeah. 
And, you know, they were solving a problem they themselves had, had a wonderful story to tell about it. And as they say, the rest is history. Yeah. They built a business around solving that problem. Amazing. Um, let's move on to creativity because I know you are you have a really big passion for creativity as well, and you are uh, doing a, a play. So can you t uh, talk to us about your play and, and the course that you teach? And they may be related or they may be two different questions that depends on how you want to answer them. So I'll build you a bridge from designing a line of fashion to making a film to making a play. Fun. All seem like very disparate activities, but in fact, they're very much the same. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the protocols for most businesses are very similar. Now there's, there's vocabulary and jargon, but in terms of best practices and what you need to do, they're very much the same. So when I was designing clothes, I would do a sketch. And then from that sketch, uh, I would give that to a pattern maker. And, you know, here's the fabric I want to use. Here's the sketch. Here's what I want to want it to look like. And when I started in the clothing business, one of the first things I did is take a shirt that I liked the fit of yeah, yeah. and literally cut it apart just to see what the pieces to that puzzle were that made a shirt. So uh, giving it to a pattern maker, knowing how much yardage that was needed, how much labor that was needed how much would it cost between labor and materials? How long would it take to do so I can deliver it on deadline? And what can I sell it for and make a profit and get paid for? So it's from an initial idea in the head to a sketch, to breaking it down into its component parts, into finally pricing it, selling it, billing and getting paid. Well, making a film, I had to come up with an idea sketch it out that's called a storyboard yeah the component parts which were how many cameras did we need location how much labor did we need how much would it cost to do that could we deliver it in the time and budget that we we're talking to the client about is there a market for something at that price and it was the whole same dynamic the same thing and so making that transition and that's where i had a real epiphany is well the businesses are kind of the same you know, it's not that alien to making a film to designing a line of clothing. Going to the doing a play, it's the same thing again. I come up with an idea. I create that idea into put that idea into words, do scene breakdowns for budgeting, how much cast, which is labor, does it take? What kind of what are the sets going to cost the location, just like in making the film? And what's it going to cost to do it? Because I had to raise money to do it. And it was the same thing. The same process applied to all of three of those disciplines. So I think it's important to also have your mind open enough that you can recognize the similarities as opposed to focusing on the differences. Uh, yeah, yeah. So when people say, oh, I can never do that. Well, you can never do what? You know, think about it. Because maybe when you break it down into pieces, you see that it's not all that different. And the reason that I'm passionate about that message is because it fosters the opportunities for creative collaborations that could be really fabulous and really wonderful and open doors to things that you never imagined before. So in doing the filmmaking, as in doing the play, I work with fantastically talented people doing wonderful creative collaborations I love doing it. It's a total blast. And, you know, there's ways to foster that creative collaboration to make it a pleasure to do because it can be a drag. It all depends on how you approach your work. Sure. Uh, so the play, there was a story that I felt had to be told. And that was a story about Lloyd Price. Yeah. And Lloyd Price was an icon of rock and roll, one of the cornerstone figures. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And Lloyd, with his first song, Lottie Miss Claudie, broke down the wall that was called Race Records, where you could only buy records by black artists in black record stores. Yeah. But there's one thing that nobody is prejudiced about, and that's green. And the green, because this was the first song by a teenager that sold over a million records. So that shattered the wall called Race Records, uh, and it shattered that wall uh, because people wanted to make the money from it, didn't want to miss the opportunity to do it. And so there was a story to be told about race, 
about the civil rights movement, about the birth of rock and roll, and about this one man's journey who refused to be a victim and stood up to all of these things to prevail and become a very significant, significant figure in rock and roll music. So it's a great story. Yeah. So I was compelled to tell this story of this unsung hero that nobody really knew. And, you know, the same thing with my book, which is based on the class, it's called Creative Careers, Making a Living with Your Ideas. I felt that there were ideas, just like in the play, that there are important ideas. In the class, there's important ideas that I wanted to communicate to a much wider audience, not unlike the things you and I have been discussing about creating a brand, about when do you go all in, how do you foster creative collaborations, and lots of things that are both very practical and other things that are quite philosophical, like what is success to you? What is failure to you? And what do these things mean? And questions that I think people should ask themselves as they embark on their careers. So again, it was the creativity, that compelling need to get something out there and spread ideas because to me, ideas being exchanged, good ideas being worked on and refined, that's what's really exciting and fun to me. Yeah. So the play does that, filmmaking does that, the book does that. And it's about that idea exchange that can make things better and more exciting. That's, okay. uh, that's excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for going into that detail. And I really appreciate your, um, you know, your take on uh, being open-mindedness, uh, open-minded and being flexible and, and taking the skills that you learn in one profession, applying it to another and continue to evolve. That is, I think that is one thing that I really appreciate about you. A lot of people, they get sort of, stuck in one job or one role for forever and hence lose a lot of their uh, creative uh, uh, creative sort of ability to uh, innovate. Well, I think one of the things that happens and it's unfortunate, but it happens when you're very young is a lot of times creativity gets squashed out of you. Yes, yes. yes. And what happens is that people are afraid to express uh, and by the way, let why don't we first even define what creativity is? Mm -hmm. What sure. is your what is your sense of creativity? How would you define it? The way I define it is like uh, doing something better. Uh, for me, I, I think uh, humans have solved pretty much all the basic problems that we need to solve. Uh, so either we create new problems to solve, or we solve the existing problems in a better way. So that's uh, that's how I look at it. Well, if you look at the world today, we haven't solved the problems with race. We haven't solved the cure for the coronavirus. <laughs> you know, we're, 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 we're dealing with a lot of new problems now, some old actually like race. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's always problems to be, to be solved. Right. And, and the reason I bring that in is not to get political, but it's that to me, creativity is the compelling need to bring about change. Mm, yeah, yeah. And so that can be that you want to paint something different and express that or write a play like in my case or a book and get that out there. But it can also mean a movement to be like Black Lives Matter, okay? That's, that's a creative movement in the sense it didn't exist before yeah, yeah. and the purpose for being is to bring about change. Gotcha. And so whatever that is, the compelling need to bring about change is a creative act. Yeah. And, and I think that to me, that's what creativity is, is that it's almost like you can't help it, yeah. you know, you know, that you've got, you've just want to do that. I mean, the transition that you went through in your life, yeah. you know, you had a compelling need to change yeah. and you unlocked your formula in order to do it. I'm sure it wasn't, bam, you got it. And from then on, the news was a rich man, <laughs> you know, you wish, right? We, we all do, but it's, it's, it's a lot of work along with it. Right. But you had a sense of purpose for it. Yeah. And I think without that sense of purpose, why create anything? Yeah. Why do anything? You know? And so I think that understanding why you're doing it is really important because that can sustain your motivation when inevitably things are going to get tough. That's true. Because you got to sustain that motivation. Otherwise, you just, uh, and you give up, you know? know? So that's my feeling of what, what creativity is, is that compelling need to bring about a change. And that, by the way, 
opens the doors quite wide. You could be a dentist and come up with a new teeth whitening thing that is faster, easier, and cheaper. And that's very creative. Yeah. All entrepreneurs that start a business are creating a business out of nothing. Yeah. And they're building it into something that's creative. And I think we need to not just define creativity in terms of the arts, but create, look at creativity as part of our daily activity. Yeah. And how do we bring creativity to what we do? For sure. Well, thank you so much for for making the world a better place with your creativity and uh, all that you have contributed. So, uh, and and thanks a lot for going into your story and sharing it so openly and uh, giving us so much wisdom. Uh, now, uh, if people want to reach out, if they want to buy your book, if they want to, you know, uh, have a peek into your the play that is coming up, how can they get in touch with you? How can they buy your books? So there's, there are a few ways. And I think if you're sparked at all by what you and I have been talking about, uh, if you look me up on LinkedIn and you see my name there, if you look me up on LinkedIn, just last week, I started a group uh, called Creative Careers. And the kind of discussions that we've been having are the kind of discussions that I'm hoping to foster and make it a real creative hub for the exchange of ideas, whether it's about your business, whether it's about art, whether it's about philosophical questions, uh, those kinds of things. So you can look at me up on LinkedIn, the Creative Careers Group. Uh, you can go to at a creative career, which is the Instagram uh, that I have set up. And there you'll see short clips from the wide range of guests that I've had, video clips that are quite cool. Uh, there is a uh, website that we just launched also last week, and it's www.acreativecareer.com, which has longer clips and goes into more detail about it. And then there is madoffproductions.com, M-A-D-O-F-F, -F, like it's spelled there, productions with an S.com. And there you can see uh, the kind of of film work and video work that I do. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a good way to start. And then uh, go to your favorite bookseller <laughs> and uh, get creative careers, making a living with your ideas. Uh, and I think there's things that if you like what we've been talking about, going into a lot more depth in the book. Can I hold up the book like I'm on a TV yeah, show? Please, there please. we go. There you oh, go. There you go. And, and my daughter, by the way, designed the cover. Nice. So I was very proud of that too. Uh, so that's, those are the ways, you know, to, uh, to reach out. Awesome. So we'll put those links uh, in the show notes so that people can reach out uh, easily. Uh, we'll put a link to the Amazon uh, book uh, link as well. And uh, I just want to say, you know, uh, I've uh, known Jeffrey only a few weeks uh, here, but uh, from what I have seen, his work and uh, the the stuff that he talks about, teaches, it's uh, it's been tremendous uh, learning experience just in a short span of time. So highly recommend his book and uh, check out his play as well. So uh, and uh, and talk to him, uh, reach out. Uh, and thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, and on this episode, I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Thanks.